was founded to provide a nonpartisan public policy advisory organization to help our residents better understand the most complex topics that impact our state, ranging from gas pipeline discussions, health care, education, permanent fund, infrastructure, energy, fiscal, and now food security. Our mission is to educate Alaskans about these policy issues and to identify effective solutions. If you are not yet a member of Commonwealth North, I highly encourage you to join and we would welcome your participation and perspective. Would the members of Commonwealth North please stand? I'd like to personally thank all of you for your membership and the tremendous work you've done to educate Alaskans, including our policy leaders. Thank you. You know, it's almost counterintuitive to say, since we're having a telecom discussion, but can you please remember to silence your cell phones? <laughs> I am Mary M. Pease, board member and past president of Commonwealth North. I am excited to share with you a panel of telecom experts with one specific message for Alaskans today. How can we close the rural broadband gap here in Alaska and the Arctic? Telcom started out as a regulated monopoly, but with the Telcom Act, competition and deregulation has brought many advances. However, in Alaska, we have continued to struggle with providing affordable broadband access across our state. For the 20 years between 1998 and 2018, Alaska has been committed over $4 billion in federal universal service funding for all elements of universal service. Yet broadband access has not been solved in our state. Broadband is so very important to 21st century economics. Businesses, governments, nonprofits, schools, healthcare facilities, families and individuals, they all have financial and economic aspirations and plans. Practically all of those plans in the 21st century mandate access to broadband. Recent announcements seem encouraging for those entities awaiting connectivity at broadband speeds of 25 by 3. But it is difficult to see which of these projects on the table can deliver that affordable component of broadband to Alaskans and the Arctic. Let's talk about some recent announcements. Did anyone see the news just the other day from the RCA? The multi-million dollar fund used to pay for improvements to rural telephone and internet service in Alaska is running out of money. And state regulators have begun discussing whether it makes sense to simply end the fund rather than fix the problem. In 2018, according to the annual report of the company that manages the fund, our Alaskan telecom companies received 29.5 million that year in universal service payments. On other fronts, Quintillion Partners uh, partnered with AP Telecom in Asia and the US to expand their reach to the global markets via a trans-Pacific fiber optic network serving North America and Asia. Currently, Quintillion has landing spots in Nome, Kotzebue, Point Hope, Wainwright, and Barrow. Leonardo DRS, through partnership with Quintillion, has focused on broadband fiber and microwave connectivity from the North Slope to Fairbanks. MTA has a fiber project that will uh, take us from the Alcan Highway to Canada with three terabytes of capacity. Astronauts and Pacific Data Port have teamed up on a satellite broadband access project the Astronus' first microsatellite in geostationary orbit. The satellite will fill a slot that's been set aside for Pacific Data Port as a capacity of 7.5 gigabits, which is enough to more than triple the satellite capacity that we currently have in Alaska. On the LEO front, that's low Earth orbit satellites, OneWeb announced plans to provide fiber-like internet coverage to the Arctic starting as early as 2020. Using the company's planned mega constellation of satellites, the company says it can provide high-speed internet to homes, boats, and planes, all located above the 60th parallel. The company plans to launch an initial constellation of 650 spacecraft that will beam internet connectivity to a series of ground terminals on the Earth's surface. Alaska Communications and GCI. 
the fiber microwave wireless workhorses of the telecom market in our state. It will be interesting to see where these publicly traded companies feel the future of our state and the Arctic can be optimized in broadband service coverage. Personally, I think that Alaska and the Arctic will be best served by a cooperative working relationship between all the entities above, focused on a goal of that affordable broadband connectivity that will connect us globally to our business partners around the world. At this time, I'd like to introduce our head table. We have Heather Handyside, Vice President of Corporate Communications at GCI. My longtime friend, Leonard Steinberg, General Counsel and Senior Vice President for Alaska Communication Systems. Chuck Schumann, also a longtime friend, who was Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Pacific Data Port. Christine O'Connor, Executive Director of the Alaska Telecom Association. And Vicki Kelly, who is the head for Alaska of Leonardo DRS. Please help me welcome our head table. A special thanks goes out today to Leonardo DRS and Pacific Data Port for sponsoring today's program. I'd also like to recognize Alaska Communications and GCI for their membership with Commonwealth North. They have been strong business members and supporters of our programs over the years. It is support of our sponsors and our members that enable Commonwealth North to fulfill our mission and to bring you programs like the one we have today. Uh, we're going to begin the program with a 10 minute overview from each of our panelists and then we are going to open it up to questions. And given the logistics of this, we are going to steer slightly away from our tradition of bringing all the cards up to me and then I'll read the questions. Today, given the amount of panelists we have and the time restraints, please stand up and ask your question directly to the panelists. So with that, let's take it away and who wants to go first? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> Come on up to the mic. I'll dive in. Since as the association, my main job is to be a fan club for all of the members here at the table. So appreciate the opportunity to be here at Commonwealth North. Um, also, many member companies in the audience, probably the majority. So. Um, I love policy, I know too much about regulation, so this, this will be fun. My name again is Christine O'Connor, I'm the Executive Director of Alaska Telecom Association, a role I've been in for about five years, so we are the trade association representing the telecom providers, which these days that means broadband. Although we still provide essential landline services, long distance services, um, the bulk of the investment in our focus is on broadband. Um, I live most of my life in Dillingham. I still go back every summer to go commercial fishing in the set netter in the Michigan. So it gives me a nice cross section, I think, of the broadband situation across the state. These days I live in the Mighty Map too, where my um, cooperative, MTA, can give me pretty much any broadband service I want at a very affordable price. Compared to when I go to fish camp and I have a couple generations out of date HughesNet which I'm grateful to be able to access because that usually gets me connected. Before, um, can you next slide please? I'm gonna mainly talk about policy and talk about the Alaska Universal Service Fund, but I wanted to go a little bit into the overall landscape. We could advance this slide. Oh, thank you, Ryan. So the landscape, um, we are so focused on broad, getting broadband where we don't have it. Um, what I'm finding is there's a misperception out there that Alaska is a broadband wasteland. And it, that couldn't be farther from the truth. We have, my members have invested in broadband networks, particularly over the last five years, and made tremendous progress. As you can see though, um, where the divide really is, is in that urban and rural breakdown. Oh, and make that 89% of the mobile LTE at the top, the overall access to mobile LTE. So that is what leads us to the perception 
when you look at that breakdown, that there's really no broadband in Alaska. There is. Um, we have fiber in the home in many communities. Um, we have members deploying fiber in the home everywhere from Barrow to Ketchikan to Cordova, uh, out in Matsu here in Anchorage. I pulled up, the FCC keeps a map of recent deployment, and in the last five years, over 93,000 locations all across Alaska have either been newly deployed or upgraded to a minimum of 25 degree speeds. So that's good news for Alaskans. Things are changing quickly. When you think about broadband in Alaska, as most of you probably know, it's really in kind of two pieces. You need that connection to your home. You also need that connection to the world. Uh, and historically, we have been a bit delayed or needed a lot more investment in growth. Back in 2010, this is what our connection with the outside world looked like. You can see those fibers going down to Seattle, um, go forward to 2019, and there's a lot of those areas of that middle mile infrastructure have been filled in. What the map doesn't show also is tremendous investment in the last mile networks in the last five years or so. That's that improved connections. That's a variety of technologies, which I think um, some of the other members will talk about, so I won't go into detail. But all together, we're getting a lot more connectivity out to Alaskans. Unfortunately, there's a lot further to go. Sometimes to try to put it in perspective, I'll tell outside policymakers that we're trying to connect 22% of the U.S. landmass and I have 15 carrier members. That's a big lift, and we've done an amazing job to get as far as we have. I had a, um, a nonprofit call me about a year ago and say, we're gonna help you. We're gonna help you figure out how to get broadband to Alaska. I said, well, thank you. We talked a bit longer, and finally I said, well, do you have any funding? Do you have money? Well, no, but we know these programs. I said, again, thank you, but it's not that we don't know how to do this. It just takes money. So I'll touch on a couple of those sources that are incredibly critical for Alaska. On the federal side, USDA has a new program, the ReConnect grant program, directly funded through appropriations. The first round is in those um, applications are in evaluation right now. We expect awards to be announced later this year. Uh, three applications went in from Alaska. Um, very optimistic that maybe one of them will be funded. Um, we did have a few struggles with that program. Some of the criteria, um, USDA, um, apologies to our, our US uh, representatives, but they're, they love farms, they're, they love farms, because they're from the lower 48. We're a little short on farms here, although in the Matsu we do have a couple, but we have been very encouraged in the conversations we've had with our US and USDA giving that feedback over the past six months or so, and we think that the program is going to end up working for Alaska. The second round is coming up later this winter, um, and I'm hopeful that, and I expect more applications from Alaska. And of course, there's a universal service fund. This is the workhorse that has made Alaska's networks possible. Without this fund, I, I'm convinced, and the members agree with me, that our networks would be just a shadow of what they are today. Um, it's in the four buckets. You've got your high cost, E-rate, rural health care, and lifeline. What we've seen is when those programs provide certainty, even though we would probably disagree at times with the sufficiency, certainty is what lets things really accelerate. One example is the high cost fund. In 2011, the federal FCC decided to reform it. All good, except their initial attempt at reform uh, was detrimental to Alaska. We immediately saw a 22% decrease with no end in sight. When that was stabilized in 2016, we just saw a flood of investment just because companies could count on what they were getting. Similar situation happening right now with uncertainty in the rural health care fund is putting projects on hold and inserting a lot of uncertainty into that investment. On the state side, um, we have had a universal service fund on the state side humming along for quite some time, and it's been very valuable. I don't know that a lot of people are aware of it. 
But that fund provides essential support for connectivity. It began as a land, basically a landline support fund. <coughs> it was responsible for reducing costs enough that we finally got our long distance rates to parity in state and out state. I think this whole room probably remembers when our in state long distance rates were very high. You could call New York City for less than you could call you know, someone in Bethel. This fund allowed those rates to finally come into, uh, to be the same. That's a huge achievement, and it was done through some offsetting some of the costs of the networks. Today, the fund is still very important, and it's essentially supporting broadband services in most areas because the networks have converged. So you need a strong network. You're continuing to provide landline, long distance services, but also broadband service. Um, historically, it has been about $30 million, all carriers. Um, are supported through that. Uh, the RCA completed a round of reform last year, which took effect January 1st, and reduced that fund, also reducing the surcharge on consumers' bills. This is funded through a surcharge on all in-state telecom services, so landline, long distance, or wireless. Um, the problem has been that base of revenue is shrinking. When you think about how many landlines are out there, they're still there, almost half of Alaskans have one, but it's a shrinking base. So that was driving the percentage on customers' bills very high. And the RCA took action, capped that percentage, and thereby shrunk the fund about a third. We've had continuing reduction in that revenue base. So at the end of the year, we're expecting to be on a, around $15 million going forward. That's a painful reduction. We recognize the reality of the shrinking contribution base. And we've actually begun working together as an industry to create a solution. What has worked in other states? What are some pitfalls we should avoid that won't work in Alaska? Because, say it with me, we're different. It's true in this case also. Um, so industry was working on this actively um, about the time the RCA, actually before, and then the RCA put this on their agenda and the meeting that has gotten generated the headline that we saw in the ADN yesterday. I want to clarify a bit. The fund is not running out of money. The fund, what it's bringing in, is tipping less than what it's obligated to pay out. However, the regulations have baked in a mechanism to account for that. It spreads a pro rata cap. So there's not a crisis that must be addressed Immediately, the fund is not running out of money. However, it does need to be put on a sustainable basis so that it can continue to support our, our networks going forward. And the last one, very briefly, you may have seen in the news, is the Birch Bill. Uh, Senator Birch sponsored a bill to remove a lot of outdated regulation statutes that were 50 years old out of, off the books and will strip the corresponding wasteful regulations also off the books. Uh, the chair of the RCA supported the bill, uh, Chairman Pickett there, uh, second from the right. Uh, he said, you know, these old statutes and regulations were generating a blizzard of paper at the commission and creating work without value. We absolutely agreed with that. The bill passed with a large bipartisan majority. And so that's a big benefit, a big policy, uh, positive thing for us. So with that, Thank you very much, Commonwealth North, and I'm happy to answer questions as we go forward. Serve urban, rural, and bush 
months ago. And um, uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, picture of uh, our network and the areas that we serve. We have um, two submarine fiber optic cables that run to the lower 48 and connect us with the rest of the world. We have um, a, uh, two different uh, pathways to reach uh, Fairbanks. Uh, we have two paths into Juneau uh, and um, serve uh, many other areas, including the Arctic, uh, which we serve in a uh, combination of our facilities and uh, our partner Quintillion uh, their facilities. This is just a little more detailed uh, uh, map on where we serve in the Arctic. And as you can see, it uh, covers uh, some of the oil fields and then as well as some of the major communities uh, there. And um, again, much of this is in partnership with uh, Quintillion Networks. So um, one of the uh, new technologies we're using to bring broadband into rural parts of Alaska is using a fixed wireless uh, network to bring uh, high-speed internet to uh, areas that have not had uh, those kinds of facilities. Um, this is um, fairly fairly new technology. We are uh, designing a network that delivers um, at least 25 megabytes per second. But in fact, most cases we're finding that our service is uh, uh, better than that. Um, and um, uh, many, many folks, many of our customers are receiving up to 50 megabytes per second uh, over this fixed wireless network. These images are images from um, uh, a recent install of the fixed wireless service in the, on the Kenai Peninsula. And you can see that um, there's a uh, receiver which is attached to the house to receive the signal. And, um, and then it goes right in, into the house and provides all the internet service uh, that people people were receiving. Um, the reception uh, uh, by the customers have been, been very positive. These are just a couple of customer quotes we've had on this service. Uh, people have been very, very pleased uh, and uh, happy to have the service and happy about how fast and reliable it's been. Um, there's a, a different service we're providing and uh, it's a service we call Internet Now. Um, we provide that service um, as a uh, instantly uh, available internet service. Doesn't require any uh, trucks to uh, come out to your location and, and, uh, and no future installation dates. Um, it provides an opportunity where we have the, this available for uh, people to come in and plug into a jack or click onto a Wi-Fi network and uh, sign up uh, immediately uh, with a credit card, just like you would at a hotel. And, um, and have a high-speed internet. This, this internet service is then deployed to um, places on military uh, uh, bases. A uh, little picture on the left, is, I believe, is from j -Bear. And um, in some uh, large um, uh, multi-family type uh, units, such as the uh, baggage towers in Whittier on the right, uh, the picture on the right. Um, the service has been um, uh, very well received. Uh, we deliver, I believe, typically about 50 megabytes per second on this service, uh, where, um, and in many places, it's upgradable to 100 megabytes per second. Um, uh, it's worked really well for our um, uh, members of the military who are often on deployment. There's no contract. You pay for what you use, and you don't have to pay for what you don't use. So if you could get, uh, get uh, uh, on deployment, and you're, you're out of state for three or six months, you're not paying for anything, there's no contract. As soon as you come back, you just sign on and you're back on, uh, and it's, uh, you're instantly back, back connected. So it's been, been very well received, um, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to doing, doing more of that. Um, this is just a map that shows uh, some areas on the Kenai Peninsula where we will be building out that fixed wireless network that we talked about just a few moments ago. This is just an example of one area. Certainly we're not restricted to the Kenai Peninsula, but that's one area that we're going to. Um, we will also be building out in areas around the outskirts of Fairbanks and um, other areas in, in, in the state with the same technology. <sighs> One of the, the things that we're doing is we're exploring using TV white spaces. 
in this effort, we are working with uh, both Microsoft uh, and Radwin to explore the use of TV white space spectrum for uh, delivering fixed wireless um, internet access. Uh, the advantage of the TV white space is it's in a spectrum in a frequency range that allows for much greater propagation than most of the uh, uh, wireless spectrum that's available today. So um, this is an opportunity to um, work with some of the largest companies in the world and uh, see what we can bring to Alaskans to enhance uh, the delivery of, um, of uh, high-speed internet. Uh, in, in the same vein, we are also working with Facebook uh, to um, uh, see if we can tr trial uh, one of their new technologies in the delivery of uh, wireless internet, it's something called Teragraph. It's a service they have patented, and, um, and we're working to trial that. Um, we also use satellite. We have uh, our own uh, satellite service that we um, use to reach uh, remote areas. Uh, this is an image of uh, the Cuspec School District, which we serve um, uh, with satellite, C-band satellite service. And um, uh, that's been uh, a growing area of uh, service for our company, and we use it to reach some of the more remote parts of Alaska. This is just a map that shows some of the places where we um, have delivered C-band and, uh, and KU uh, satellite service. Uh, and you can see it reaches to uh, areas of Alaska that are, are um, many of which are very difficult to reach otherwise. So there's a lot of talk going around. You'll hear from uh, uh, myself, you'll hear from others about low Earth orbit satellite. Um, has a lot of promise. The, the primary advantage of low Earth orbit satellites is that they are low. Uh, what that means is they're not so far away, they have much um, less latency in uh, delivery of um, traffic. So latency is an issue when you have interactive type programs and, um, and you have to be uh, going back and forth from one party to another. Uh, the fact that um, Today, most of the satellite services that are delivered are at high altitude uh, satellites, which have considerable latency, but the new generation of low Earth orbit satellites uh, promise uh, uh, a level of latency which is very similar to fiber. So we're anxious to see what, um, what develops. Um, we don't expect commercial deployment of low Earth orbit uh, satellite technology probably until 2021. And until we see the actual commercial deployment, we don't really know what to expect. There's uh, certainly a lot of promises that are being made, but with any new technology, it's not unusual to see that some variation between uh, initial promises and what actually gets delivered. So we're, um, we are, as a company, we're engaged in discussions with uh, low Earth orbit satellite providers, uh, and we're looking forward to the technology but we're ca only cautiously optimistic about it's, it's, uh, what it's going to deliver. And that's what we had to share with you this morning and or today, and uh, happy to answer questions as we go along. background in GCI. We started in 1979. Um, that's Ron Duncan, our founder, and with that kind of outfit and that kind of sophisticated marketing, it's no wonder that we were a success, right? Um, but over the past 40 years, we have worked to deliver connectivity both to urban and to rural areas. And I think our dedication to rural areas really um, came from our other founder, Bob Walp. Um, Bob Walp was a former NASA scientist. 
he had expertise uh, con uh, connecting communities in South America. When he came to Alaska, he envisioned a time that we would deliver connectivity, um, government services, education, health care, uh, by uh, through connectivity. This is a picture of him and with Bob and Dr. Alex Hill in 1976, I believe. Um, installing the first satellite communication antenna in Ambler. And so GCI's dedication to delivering service to rural has been there since the inception, and that's what has driven us to make the investments and provide the service. And as we'll see, or as we've discussed, making those investments is sometimes a challenge in terms of making a business model, creating a single business model, and making things make economic sense. Uh, since 1979, GCI has invested um, more than $3 billion in Alaska in our networks, our facilities, our infrastructure. Um, we have 2,000 employees across the state. We serve 240 communities. Um, but when you're serving that great of an area, as Christine said, you really have to have a big toolkit and be ready to use all op options to deliver that service. So here, uh, GCI you know, works with fiber, we, we deliver connectivity through microwave, also through satellite. And for a moment, I just want to focus on our fiber. So if GCI and other providers in the room today uh, deliver one gig service across Alaska, one gig service is really kind of the gold standard for consumer connectivity. Those are the fastest speeds you're going to be able to get as a consumer. And not only GCI, but MTA, other providers across the state have worked really hard to make the investments so that we can deliver one gig to communities across Alaska. This is just the map of GCI communities. And if you look, these communities represent one gig access to 80% of Alaskans. So when you're talking about broadband availability in the state, 80% of Alaskans have access to one gig speeds. And if you look at broadband now, we track a, a site that monitors uh, this data. If you compare that to other states, GCI is well ahead of Texas and Florida and California in terms of ubiquity of one gig service. And that's because when we make the investment, we invest in the entire community, the entire city, not just the high residential population areas or the business community. So I think this is important to note um, because when we're talking about connecting Alaskans, I think often you hear that Alaska is behind the rest of the U.S. in terms of being able to access service, when really, in some cases, we're ahead. And I would challenge you to define in any other uh, Sitka or Petersburg or Wrangell, I know that we don't necessarily define those communities as rural, but any place in the lower 48 would define those as rural. So delivering one gig speeds in these rural communities, I think, is a very powerful statement to make. And we've been able to make those, um, provide that kind of service because of the investment. Um, as Christine noted, you know, here was investment that what our networks look like in terms of wireless, micro or in terms of fiber, uh, broadband, and satellite in 2010. And here's what they look like today. Um, and I would say that this map is a reflection of the success of many of the policies that are in place. It's because of the federal policies that help us make business case, that help these investments make economic sense, that we've been able to make this substantial build out. If you put this map on the lower 48, this would be basically building out the entire Midwest. This is a significant achievement, and I think it's important to show this and people to know about this, because we want to demonstrate that Alaska, Alaska providers are making these investments, that we are responsible stewards of the federal funds, and that when you want to create programs and demonstrate efficiencies and progress, you look to Alaska to make that happen. So like uh, Christine and Leonard, um, I've been approached by nonprofits who want to help us solve the broadband, the rural divide. And you know, when you talk about 80% of Alaska being ha having access to one gig speeds, we can do better and we will be doing better in rural Alaska to make sure that we invest in the technology to increase service there as well. But we have significant challenges there, one of them being the economic models that I discussed, but also the lack of private land. 
Um, right now, 12% of Alaska is private land, 24% is state of Alaska owned, and 62% is U.S. government owned. So when you put that on top of the small populations and the vast distance, it simply doesn't um, make sense for some of the proposals that we're hearing. Often, um, nonprofits will come and say, you know, if you could just build fiber to these communities, that's simply just not possible for much of rural Alaska. And that's why, in addition to fiber and our Terra network, it's a microwave network that serves 84 communities and provides access to 45,000 homes in the world, we also rely on our satellite, um, on satellite technology to deliver service. Um, we use our satellite technology as a primary delivery mechanism, but also as a backup system for some of our microwave networks in the world. And we're really excited about some of the discussions about new uh, satellite technology availability and programs that are coming up. Um, we are already really an expert in delivering service over satellite. GCI provides satellite service to more Alaskans than any other provider in the state. Um, and to be honest, some of the federal policies, though, are driving our discussions to explore that more. Certainly the um, reallocation of CBAM through the NPRM that was recently announced um, are, making, are, are driving a few of those discussions. But um, we believe in terms of the satellite technology that is coming online, GCI will um, be a major player in that market. We're in conversations with uh, several vendors at the time, and we're hoping to make an announcement about some disruptive opportunities in the near future. And I think um, these, the combination of new technology, the federal programs that are available, um, really help us uh, make the case and, and incentivize us and, and keep us motivated to uh, look for new technology to deliver service to rural Alaskans. Thank you. My name is Chuck Schumann, and I am with uh, Pacific Data Port and with Mike Ocon. Mike Ocon the founder of, uh, of Pacific Data Port. And um, I just want to reflect on the title of the, uh, of the, the talk today about closing the rural broadband gap. And I agree with, um, with all the panelists today that there's a lot being done and a lot of investment that's being made to do exactly this, to close that rural broadband gap. I just don't feel that we're moving fast enough, and I don't think we're keeping up with the pace of the demand that's happening in this state and, and in the lower 48. And I'm going to give you some examples of that today of what microcom is being faced with uh, in consumer demand. And uh, so that's the way that I really want to, uh, I'm looking to reflect on what I have to say, because I think we have to pick up the pace what um, Microcom and the Pacific Data Port is working on is really um, uh, agnostic amongst the, uh, uh, everyone on the panel is that we can provide service, uh, whether it's direct to consumer or to provide middle mile or um, to connect some of the fiber systems, the fiber to the home systems that have been put in uh, to be able to give them real broadband connectivity uh, to those remote locations and not just having broadband uh, available within the community. First off, let me say I'm, I'm going to try to keep, um, uh, there's some jargon in what I have to say. I'm not going to go really deep on the technical side um, of what we're proposing right now, what we're working on, and so I welcome the opportunity to, uh, to talk with anyone who wants to go a little bit more deeper with me and have uh, uh, further conversations or, or uh, presentations about that. And. Um, so first off, I wanted to, to talk about, so there, there is a difference of definition. So in, in the lower 48, we talk about broadband as 25 megabits by 3 megabits. In Alaska, uh, a lot of times the definition is 10 by 1 megabits. Uh, all broadband is not equal. When I talk about broadband, uh, I'll be using the real definition of 25 by 3 megabits per second and, and soon to be probably something larger than that from the implications that, uh, that we hear 
from Washington, D.C. Um, the second thing is the cost of broadband are not equal. So in rural Alaska, people spend a lot more for uh, a gigabyte than they do in Anchorage. And so uh, our estimates from looking at the recent web pages of the providers is that, that rural Alaska will spend from three to 40 times the cost of a gigabyte that you spend here in Anchorage. Uh, pretty amazing to us what, uh, what those costs are. And, um, and that's what we've tried to do is to, to provide services in, in, in as many areas as we could to keep those costs down and to, um, uh, to provide affordable broadband. So the providers in rural Alaska are not all delivering broadband, um, but they, they might be meeting the latency requirements. I think uh, Leonard talked a little bit about that. And for us, it's what is more important to the consumer. And we've chosen right now to focus on speed and price and then make latency an option. Um, the problem for us is that most companies do not like to put satellites out over the Pacific. So the optimal locations for a satellite would be kind of up above Hawaii that would provide the highest look angle to Alaska. And uh, companies like to put their satellites over the continental U.S. And that's what results in the low look angles to Alaska while we're out looking over the Chugach Mountains and just barely clearing the trees. And um, there's probably some of you in the audience that we've been out to try to install an antenna at your house and uh, haven't been able to do that because we've said you had a no line of sight. And um, it's a very frustrating thing and, and people don't like to hear that from us is that, uh, what do you mean I can't get that service or I can't get my Sunday ticket or, or whatever it might be. And, uh, but that's why, is that people don't put the, uh, the uh, satellites out over the Pacific, which would give us the highest look angle. Um, I do want to mention there is, there could be no doubt that Microcom has installed more satellite antennas in Alaska than any other company, because we have uh, installed tens of thousands of satellite antennas in this state, and so we have a real understanding of service throughout Alaska and uh, of all kinds of services, whether they be broadband or, or television. Um, I just got back yesterday with some new information here. I know these are busy, but I put them in there because we've, we've talked to a lot of people in this audience and sometimes we have not been able to, to speak about things because we would be under a non-disclosure agreement and can't, uh, yeah, can't talk about it for one reason or the other. So some of the information that just came out of a conference that I got back to in Paris um, is helpful in this this discussion and I think uh, um, fills in some of the voids. This particular one is a slide from Northern Sky Re Research that uh, talks about a, a uh, study that was just completed for Pacific Data Fort and I, some, of the, some of the quotes are meaningful for this discussion. So Alaska has a clear undersupply of high quality satellite capacity. Most satellite oper operators have not focused on the orbital positions that serve Alaska due to other business plan priorities. And the orbital positions that would allow coverage of the entire Alaskan territory with look angles above 10 degrees, 145 west to 165 west are empty, um, exactly in the space where PDI has secured orbital slots and plans to position in satellites. And then they end with, given, given its dispersed population and challenging geographic conditions, terrestrial alternatives are very expensive to deploy and will continue to leave wide portions of the population with very poor or non-existent connectivity. And then, here we go. Is a laser pointer around here? The top of it. Yeah. So this again um, emphasizes what I talked about, about most of the satellites are over here to the eastern part. This is the area of the satellite arc that's more favorable to Alaska. And then of course then we have a lot of satellites that are out here that, that are providing service to um, the western Pacific or um, Asia. In that case. Um, this was a slide from the same presentation that talks about the, uh, the demand of consumer broadband. And um, key quotes off of this busy slide is currently the region is poorly served, that NSR does not expect NGSOs to pose a big threat for the particular vertical, given that the end user terminals for those architectures is still unresolved and, and the cost remains an insurmountable barrier. And that was a key one that we wanted to talk about for more for some time, but uh, is finally coming out a little bit more publicly. And, um, and I think that's, um, that was a big, um, a big revelation. 
So NSR expects newly available capacity to rapidly activate double-digit growth in the area, adding over 10,000 subscribers in the next three or four years. These were just comments about our business plan. So this is a slide that was shown at this conference uh, on Tuesday morning at a breakfast. And this was the, uh, it's a world satellite conference in Paris that occurs every year. And NSR does a breakfast, and so I asked if I could use these slides uh, today for this conference, and they uh, graciously said that that was fine. And the, the key here is, is this lays out some of the LEO plans that are uh, LEO systems that are being planned for deployment. And then this column here talks about how far north latitude that they will operate. And uh, so what comes out of this is that most of these constellations will not be able to serve Alaska because they're, they only serve lower latitude areas. And that's one thing that doesn't come out immediately when we start hearing about plans for SpaceX and Starlink and Amazon's new system or Empower system. In fact, I've had people come to me and say, well, we're gonna buy some, some Empower capacity because the sales team has told us that we can do that. And, and we just have to sit there and agree to them, but we um, we knew that wasn't possible, but uh, we have to let them make to their, their own conclusions on that. Um, and the last one of these busy slides was uh, an example for us. They actually uh, used the group, yeah, they, um, they used the old name because that's what's on most of the maps, but they spelled this out that, um, Right up here, we talked about only a subset of the planned constellation shells will reach latitudes as high as uh, Upiavik, and um, and then that uh, O three B or SpaceX can only do it when they deploy their second generation of their Neo systems that um, will provide service uh, in the higher latitudes. And the other key part on this slide was some of the limitations for service capacity, and this is something that we tracked for a long time, is that with uh, OneWeb in particular, we'll only be able to get about 450 megabits per beam, and so it's, that's gonna be in a, in, in a state of flux every second is that uh, satellite is moving through. And so these are great solutions for certain applications and they're great add-ons uh, for us. Our business plan from the beginning has been to use Leo, with our geo that we're developing and so you'll be able to determine how much you want of each and that um, and then we can give you on an application specific basis we can so we can give you uh, the lowest cost geo or your uh, lowest uh, latency solution but it will be at a higher cost um, for your particular solution um, This is currently where we are, and I wanted to talk to you, I mentioned earlier about falling behind. So the total HDS capacity covering Alaska is less than two gigabits per second currently. Um, there is virtually no sellable capacity on any HDS system over, um, over Alaska at present. Now what's happened is that in the, um, we've really had three systems. So our favorite has been the Viasat system, which is has this little bit of coverage here extending from South Central up through Kotzebue. And, um, and this, scene, this system uh, was deployed back in uh, early 2014. And we sold that beam out in about a year with many thousands of subscribers. Um, it went into a managed status and then four weeks ago it was closed. And what that means is we cannot add another single subscriber to that beam. And what's happened is, is that the demand is continually increased from subscribers within that beam to the point that now everyone is getting unhappy with the service that they have. And that's really troubling to us because Microcom has won two national awards on our sales and our ability to have happy consumers over the past four years. Two times out of the three times that award was given for Viaset. And so we're really happy about that. And so now to have uh, consumers just taking so much of that capacity that they become unhappy with the service, uh, it's troubling to us. And there was nothing that we could do about it because there's no planned systems to replace that, um, that capacity. And so there's about 450 um, megabits on that beam. And that kind of, uh, it starts to show you a little bit of the problem that we see with, uh, uh, with OneWeb. 
with having limited amounts of capacity like that. We did find some capacity. We convinced Hughes to put these two beams on the Jupiter 2 um, satellite, but it's at a very, very low look angle. And so over 55% closing on 60% of the customers that try to sign up for this service can't get it because of its low look angle. And, um, and then we have some, some interim capacity, KU band capacity that we've been selling. Um, off of uh, SES satellite, and in the last uh, week, I think it's been, my son's in the audience back here and he's shaking his head up and down, and um, we've had to close um, this beam because it's now full, and um, very frustrating because uh, he came to me this morning and said, are we really not going to bid on this particular project, and, and that's where we are. We cannot come up with enough capacity, and, and really, for Microcom, that's been the way from the beginning. As I remember back in building systems back in the late 80s, and I built one for, um, we finished off one for a large pipeline company, and then we went to try to, to build some systems for others, and we didn't have any more capacity to be able to use. We've always been behind the eight ball uh, for satellite capacity. And um, so, the other point here that I wanted to make before I moved on was that that Alaska remains the only U.S. state with no statewide H HTS coverage. So when we talked about other states that were ahead of, uh, of other states in the terms of deploying broadband or deploying systems, every other state has the ability that if you're in a location and you don't have a wire, you haven't been able to get a fiber, then uh, you can look to platforms that are in the sky that uh, can provide service to you. In Alaska, that's not the case. We're unique. That, uh, in that position. Um, so Microcom serves the entire state. Pacific Data Port will serve the entire state. We're, um, uh, we're there now. We have been, Microcom's been in the business now for 35 years. And uh, we've built, as I mentioned earlier, uh, tens of thousands of satellite antennas across the state um, in all corners. And so just some examples of uh, some systems that we put in Recently, I think in, in probably all three of these cases, we were we were going in and putting in uh, velocity can you ban HDS here recently. But for the reasons that I've talked about here, it was um, about four years ago when my right hand, uh, Tom Brady, which I, I want to say Tom's not here today with us. Uh, he's in the hospital, and so our thoughts are uh, with him. And uh, I did change the presentation a little bit to um, to take some. He wanted to talk more about the financial side, so I, it's got a little bit more of my fingerprint on it today than it would have if he had been here. But um, uh, the reason that we did this is we just couldn't take it anymore, and we decided to go out and do something about it. And so uh, Microcom formed uh, Pacific Data Port to build and launch the Aurora 4 satellite in what has now become the Aurora system. And so the Aurora project objective is to bring all the lessons on lightning with high-speed broadband services within what will be now two years. And on day one, offer connectivity to high-speed broadband at all points in Alaska, and focus on cost and speed, affordable broadband, and include low-latency LEO capacity in our solutions, but latency is an, an option because it will cost more money, and make capacity available to all broadband providers. So we have now stick to that, and we've proved our ability to be able to do those types of things over the last couple of decades, and, and that's our intent to do that uh, again with this. We'll even provide um, large pipe backup and redundancy for terrestrial services to prevent outages. I think there was a news article in the press here in the last couple of days that talked about news about outages that exist and, and, uh, and go on for two to three days. That's another reason that the Aurora project will be excellent for Alaska. It will provide that backup um, to fiber providers that uh, whether they be GCI or Contillion, and uh, we can we can step in and provide those large pipes that are not otherwise available for, uh, for backup capacity, even if you have a wire. Um, our solution is satellite. We've spent the last three day, uh, three years um, optimizing the design that was going to put the bits uh, on the ground where we wanted them. This is a, um, a, an artist's rendition of the first satellite that's in the upper corner. That will be known as Aurora 4A. And uh, we have secured two <coughs> ideal orbital locations at 154 and 163 degrees west. And we've designed for affordable shared launch on SpaceX Falcon rocket and also Ariane on their new um, shared system. 
Uh, we've got a pretty future-proof design in that the, um, the first satellite, as was mentioned by Marianne, will be approximately 7.5 gigabits. And the second satellite right now, the design for that, will be in excess of 80 gigabits in capacity. Um, a significant improvement on where we started out. Tom and I, uh, when we started this three years ago, we thought maybe we could hit 16.5 gig or something like that. Um, and we moved up to double that, and then we've been able to double it again. So we're really excited about the, the opportunity with Aurora 4 is really going to bring. Again, it's a two satellite solution now, Aurora 4A and Aurora 4. And this is a um, just a, a depiction of the beam coverage on Aurora 4A. Again, we are a statewide uh, solution. And um, the other thing is this is not old-fashioned satellite. So this is high-speed broadband, high-throughput uh, high satellite. And so this is the latest and greatest of the satellite world that's being deployed today. It's in operation today around the world. So it's your Viasat 1, your Viasat 2, your Jupiter 1, Jupiter 2, the new uh, constellation being planned by Viasat in, in Pacific, over the, in, over the Pacific. Um, it is the, um, the latest uh, satellite technology for broadband that is in operation today. Um, that's coverage. And so current progress is Aurora 4 as under construction in California. We signed a launch contract with SpaceX that was announced about a month ago. Looking forward to that uh, rocket launch in October of next year. And uh, we have a gateway under construction in Tokina that's scheduled for completion in December of 2019. And we're finishing up on the contract for our um, gateway in the lower 48. We've got another member of my staff here, um, Sean, that is in the, uh, the audience that's working hard on that one, that project right now. And uh, the first satellite, the Rural 4A, will commence operation in early 2021, and the second satellite will come online about a year later. Um, I think I added one more SpaceX slide because it's just, we always like to put rocket launches in our, uh, in our, in our graphics. They always, especially the Channel 2's running a, a video of SpaceX to get your attention. But milestone is achieved. SpaceX is to launch PDI's first commercial satellite into orbit, so we're really excited about that. Um, had lunch with uh, SpaceX on Tuesday, and, and uh, they're, they're really excited about being able to participate um, with us on this. And I'm sure SpaceX will be able to visit over the next year, and we'll get a chance maybe to talk more with them about where they're going. Really interesting things uh, in that company. Um, so the next one was, real quick, is we uh, purchased the facility from AT&T. Um, closed on that earlier this year. Uh, they uh, did a lot of work in getting the site ready for us to take over and blew that antenna up. A lot of you all have seen that antenna up on Comps Comsat Road in Talkeetna. have been there for 50 years and, and um, until earlier this year when it was dismantled. And, and uh, we've taken that facility over and Microcom has started the construction on the new gateway and that's what it looks like today. Those photos were taken last week. And so it's a big difference there now on what it looked like back last uh, April. This one's kept us a little busy this year. And uh, you can see a lot of the satellite antennas, new 5,000 square foot building that went in there and, uh, and fun project. And in closing on this is, <coughs> how can you help? So policies for Alaska broadband development must not leave out satellite. I think everyone that's involved in telecommunications in Alaska can agree that satellite one form or another is going to be necessary for in Alaska for a long time. And um, we should not uh, leave satellite out when we're thinking about solutions. And in fact, I would argue that uh, the satellite can get there quicker, faster, and maybe cheaper today to uh, get broadband to everyone. And then as we build in the fiber and get it to the home, then we should do that. And uh, I like to say that in my cabin in Telkina, I want a fiber to my home. But until then, I will use satellite perhaps, to, to be able to solve that. And um, I, it's, it's difficult to get wires and fibers to every home in Alaska, if not impossible. So this project and everything that I've talked about so here today is 100% privately funded to date. There's been no state or federal support to this project at all. Uh, it's a little surprising. And, um, but that's the fact of uh, where we are today. And so we invite you to support the project. You can do that by purchasing capacity and, and invest with us or you can encourage support for the project from state and federal programs. Uh, we just hope that those that need this capacity do not continue to stay on the sidelines. And 
that's my message for how you all can help. And uh, I'll close with, I think, uh, Alaska needs a world, and uh, that's why we've stepped out to build it, the microcom and Pacific Data Port. So thank you. Look forward to questions. Good afternoon. My name is Vicki Kelly, and I'm with Leonardo DRS Global Enterprise Solutions. How many of you in here are familiar with Leonardo DRS? Oh good, there's a lot of you that are not, so I'll go ahead and go through all 50 slides since we've got about a half hour left. <laughs> they always say start with humor, right? Um, I am going to give you a, a quick overview, though, of uh, the company I'm going to start at about the 30,000 foot level, and then we're going to come down to Alaska, because there are many of you in here who are not familiar with my company. So, um, we're Leonardo DRS Global Enterprise Solutions. Oh, let's see, where I'll need my glasses for this. Okay. All right. So, we were founded in 1968 is Diagnostic Retrieval Systems, and that's where the DRS comes from. At some point they dropped the Diagnostic Retrieval Systems because it made people nervous. We, we've been in business for 50 years. We uh, had a big celebration this year for our 50th year in business. Um, we are, um, as you can see, 2004, we hit a billion in sales revenue, and then we were acquired by a company called Finn Mechanica out of Rome, Italy. Today, we're Leonardo DRS. Finn Mechanica changed the name uh, a couple of years ago to Leonardo DRS, but we're still, um, our parent company is still out of Rome, Italy. So our revenues in 2015 were 14.8 billion. We're a large company. We've got 47,000 employees worldwide. We primarily um, do work um, in the US with the Department of Defense, but we're in 150 nations. We do some really interesting projects um, around the world. Um, we're currently working on one right now with the African Union nations, um, upgrading all of their um, communications. It's about 120 countries in Africa that we're currently working on that project. We recently won the FEMA contract here in the U.S., so when there's a state of emergency, we support the communications for FEMA. Um, it's a very large project. In the U.S., our headquarters are in Washington, D.C., Crystal City. We primarily um, work with the Department of Defense, and in fact, we are the largest provider of communications for the Department of Defense worldwide. So this is uh, what our business here in the U.S. looks like. Global Communications, which is the division that I'm a part of. We have Enterprise Solutions, which is just what you would think. We take very large enterprises and we take care of their networks, their infrastructure, uh, life cycle, a whole gambit. And then Aviation Services. And I don't have the security clearance, so they don't tell me a lot about that one. <laughs> But I do know that we do night, night um, vision laser goggles, and we take helicopters, and we take them apart and make them bulletproof and put them back together. We do a lot of work with the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard. Like I said, they don't tell me a lot. And these are some of the customers that we work with worldwide. So as you can see in the middle bottom is our Alaska Microwave Network. So now I'm going to bring it down to Alaska. So we've been working. No. Oh, okay. Let me back up here for just a second. So speaking of satellite, following Chuck, we are the largest purchaser of satellite capacity worldwide. And as you can imagine, because we support so much of the Department of Defense, we um, have to have a lot of capacity. 
Um, we do a lot of terrestrial backhaul services. Now I want to get to this one though. Okay, so this is a map of our satellite services worldwide. And these are the places where we do deliver service. And you can see Alaska's not in the lower left hand corner. Let me go back one. Our, um, we have a, a knock that supports the services that we provide worldwide, and that's located in Tampa, Florida. And then for our Alaska customers, we also have a knock in Montana. As you can imagine, cybersecurity is a big issue for us. And now we're going to get to Alaska. So um, in Alaska, there's a map there that shows uh, where we have either previously provided service or where we currently provide service. We've had over 200 plus satellite terminals that we've deployed across the state where we've delivered service here. We also have a microwave network in the interior of Alaska that goes from Fairbanks and follows the Yukon Koyukuk River. So this is a map of where our microwave network currently serves today. Um, we've been in business here in Alaska for 16 years, so we're not a newcomer to the state. But our primary focus has been on education and healthcare. And this particular microwave network was built to support the Yukon Koyukuk School District and Tenanon Chiefs Conference. So um, that they have um, adequate access for telemedicine, and uh, for the schools to be able to access the online curriculum. We're uh, currently in the process of continuing to build out this network. Um, we have, um, we're as far north right now as Hoos and Huslia, and we'll be going to Alakakit this spring. It took us a while to get the permitting done from the Air Force, um, and for microwave networks you'll find in Alaska, it's often very difficult to get the leases. You either have to go through the military, or you have to go through the tribal organizations. We're also a partner with Quintillion. So we provide service on the <coughs> North Slope. We currently provide service for uh, the Nome City School District, utilizing Quintillion's subsea fiber network. We also have a tower located in Dead Horse, where we're providing service for businesses in that area. And, um, we also have access to Quintillion's infield fiber, so we can serve the Crudo Bay area. So, just kidding, there aren't 50 slides. Um, I wanted to keep this short and just give you an introduction to DRS, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so very much to all of our presenters today. Um, breaking in our tradition, as I said earlier, I would like to invite everyone who not only is a speaker today, but is working in the telecom industry. I see a few of them. Um, I see Zach, I see folks from MTA and elsewhere. Please stand right now. Heather, that means you. Okay. So you see a room full of telecom experts. Many of them work with the local exchange companies. Many of them work on the satellite and the global enterprise solutions. I would invite you to come up to those people after the forum and directly ask them some questions. I mean, you heard so many acronyms today, and I know we're not telecom experts, but this is great information, it's timely, and um, if you folks don't mind hanging around until 1.30, I think the one-on-one -on -one questions and discussions would be most valuable in the true form of Commonwealth North and our dialogue opportunities. So please take advantage of that. Um, I want to thank all our panelists today. Thank you to Leonardo and Pacific Dataport for sponsoring today's program. Thank you to ACS and GCI for your membership and continued business support. I slipped into back into the old acronym there. Did you hear that? ACS instead of Alaska Communications. Um, in terms of the Hickel Award, on October 2nd, Commonwealth North is going to be hosting a dinner to continue our tradition of honoring outstanding Alaskans. These honors go to policy influencers who have led the way and added clarity to public policy issues. 
This year, we will honor Admiral Tom Barrett, President of Alaska Pipeline Services, with the Hickel Award, and John Sturgeon with the Egan Award. The evening will include great food, drinks, entertainment, and a look back at their contributions to Alaska. Former recipients of the Hickel Award, of course, Wally Hickel, Ted Stevens, Jay Hammond, Don Young, John Katz, Willie Hensley, Lisa Murkowski, Tony Knowles, Frank Murkowski, and Jim Jansen. Certainly uh, an entourage of Alaska's uh, influential business leaders and public policy decision makers. I encourage you to sponsor a table and contact Commonwealth North. In the back of the room is, we only have a few copies of this incredible Alaska map left. It was signed by um, all our previous governors and it celebrates the 150th anniversary of the purchase of Alaska. And these maps are going to go quick because for these last several that we have, we're offering them up for people in attendance at $20 a map. Thank you all for joining us today. I encourage you to become a member, pick up a membership packet, or contact our staff. We stand adjourned, and please, if the telecom experts would come up to the front of the room and allow those one-on-one -on -one dialogues uh, with each and every one of you. Thank you.